Thanks everyone for hopping on. Um, this is, let's see, the third iteration of our, uh, I guess, our training on, on what we do. Um, today, Cass is going to be talking about the 6.4 Power Stroke. Uh, it was an engine that was um, kind of a, to get forward through an emission stage. Um, so it had lots of problems. Um, came in the F-Series pickups from 08 to 10. Um, we do offer that engine in the Model C, our daily driver, the workhorse, and the cast watch, you know, several different performance packages um, to fit whatever you or your customer would need. Um, this is the only engine that we are not offering in a short block because it is so problematic. Um, so we do offer it in a long block and in the um, in a full runner. Um, with that being said, uh, Cass, if you're ready, I will uh, stop sharing and hand it over to you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, like uh, Adam said, um, today we'll be discussing the 6.4 uh, liter power stroke engine. And um, Adam, if you will uh, allow me to share my screen, I'll go ahead and put up um, the uh, some of the slides that we have available. Um, so the 6.4 liter uh, from 2008 to 2010 was actually a little trivia question for you today, and I might start out by doing this. Um, I'm going to give it away because I'm basically uh, already talking. Um, I'm already um, kind of um, talking about this engine, but a little interesting fact with the 6.4 liter. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, Adam, it's still not allowing me. Uh, it says you're not allowed to share your screen. So if you can take a look at that for me, I appreciate it. Um, but anyway, a uh, little fun filled fact that the 6.4 liter engine, thank you, got it now, um, was actually the first engine uh, that Ford had for the power strokes that um, did not fit in a, um, sorry, there we go, did not fit in the uh, E-series vehicle. So uh, this was the first engine that we see from Ford uh, that uh, did not fit in any of the of the vans which is um kind of funny because uh, obviously you know the seven threes nobody wanted to work on nobody that has ever worked on vans or any trucks especially vans nobody ever wants to work on them anyway they're extremely difficult uh diesels are extremely hard to uh they're shoehorned in most applications are really really tight especially uh when we're talking about a you know a pickup truck or a one ton truck whatever but when you start thinking about the 6.4 liter Anybody that's ever popped the hood on a 6.4 liter uh, engine knows right off the bat, holy smokes, this thing is absolutely a, uh, uh, it's just, there's so much stuff going on, right? Um, this thing has two of everything, it seems like, right? We've got two EGR coolers. We've got uh, two turbochargers. We've got uh, just a whole lot going going on the engine. And I'm really thankful that they did not figure out a way to shoehorn that thing into an E-Series van because that would have been a nightmare for anybody. So uh, moving along, the as, as Adam said, that the 2008 uh, was an emission, uh, was, a, was a year that the, uh, the emissions were changing, uh, the tier levels were changing, and Ford was in desperate need to stay, on, stay in the market. Um, obviously, this, this stuff started to take place um, earlier on. They started getting ready for this a couple years in advance. Again, much like the last... Um, uh webinar that we did in the series um interesting to note that it was a strange situation between ford and international based off of the uh, difficulty that they had with the six liter engine now in order to meet these emission standards some things were going to have to be changed uh, one of which was the huey injection system um, hydraulically actuated electronically controlled unit injector that had been used previously on the 7.3 liter and the 6.0 liter uh, would not maintain these emission standards or achieve these emission standards simply because uh, they did not have the rail pressure and atomization ultimately is what it led to. There was not enough fuel atomization to break down and incinerate particles so that the hydrocarbon levels would meet the emission standards. Um, so we knew that we were going to have to jump our rail pressure up from the 22,000 pounds of pressure um, on up from there to something a little bit higher. And that's something that you're actually seeing more and more of. We're actually seeing uh, rail pressures now at uh, 36,000 psi, but that's 
not the end of the story that I actually got stuff right now that is incre- approaching uh, 50 to 60,000 pounds of pressure, which is the latest thing that they've got going uh, in testing right now. I know that there are uh, certain manufacturers out there that, that are involved in doing that, which is well past water jet points. It's the reason why we see the difference in the piston designs and things like that, but not to get into too much uh, of that. But it, one thing that we were actually seeing is that um, obviously to meet emission standards, we've got to break the fuel mo- the, the molecules down um, to a small enough bite that we can incinerate and we can burn those. That being said, the 6.4 liter uh, was supposed to be the saving grace because uh, it got away from the internal oil leaks, um, the high pressure oil leaks and some of the failures that they were having issues with. Keep in mind the six liter, you know, and I tried to on, on this, I could just, you know, go through and say, hey, this is what we do to fix them. But I kind of like to know the history. I like to know the engineering's mindset of why they attacked the things the way that they did. Uh, anybody that's ever been a mechanic very long on the six liter engine knows the STC fitting was obviously a big problem. Uh, the oil rail logs that they changed from the O3s and, and uh, that was a that was another issue with the injector pox and different things like that. Um, so they were they fed up with it. They didn't want any more of the Hewitt injection system. And like I said, because of the emission standards, it just made sense to move to a high pressure common rail system. There's a problem, and there's a huge problem with what they did. And it was a bigger problem than what the uh, you know you've heard me say this many times before, that, and I'll say it again. But the Huey, uh, what I said the acronym uh, was. Uh, that stood for hydraulically actuated electronically controlled unit injector actually stands for in our realm uh, helping engines against uneducated installers there's a reason for that that's because if uh, this thing develops an issue with oil if it runs out of oil fine the engine's going to shut off because it uses this oil pressure uh, in order to atomize and to uh, push the intensifier piston in the injector down so that it can uh, inject the fuel into the combustion bowl now if this thing develops a high pressure oil leak, what it is, is it's almost like a guy that has, um, uh, he has internal bleeding, right? Um, but it's it's a, basically kind of like the equivalent of that on a diesel engine. There's one big problem. Um, it's fine to leak oil back into the engine. But what's not okay is to leak fuel back into the engine that has oil in it. Then we start having cross-contamination with fuel and with oil. And now we have issues with viscosity and we have a whole complete plethora of of problems, and you have the perfect storm for this engine. So I'm trying to set the uh, stage for um, the, you know, inner kind of stage right here, um, the the 6.4 liter engine. On top of the 6.4 liter engine, uh, there's a few developments that have taken place. Now we're gonna experiment, why not, right? Uh, We're gonna experiment with a dual sequential turbocharger system. Wonderful idea absolutely wonderful in its application and it works really really well there's a couple of problems the problem with it is 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 that it helps throttle response immensely um there's a big issue and we'll get into that in a minute but let me just stop there and say introduce two turbos on this engine a small one and a big one the little one feeds the big one and uh so you're covered all the way through getting on top of the charger isn't that hard fuel rail pressure uh, these engines were also known as the Max 47. My first um, exposure to the uh, the, the uh, 6.4, or we'll call it Max 47, uh, was uh, going up to the international dealer and seeing 10 of these engines that were pulled out, being replaced right out of the gate. These engines didn't have 15,000, 20,000 miles on them, and there were already been, there's 10 of them that were being yanked out and replaced. And I saw the the uh, the dock door just loaded with these things and that was my first exposure of the 6.4 liter at that time the max 47 i'm saying max 47 because that's international iteration of the uh same engine now there's quite a few differences i get this question asked a lot can you take a max 47 and drop it in a 6.4 liter will it work absolutely not um there are things that will work about it like the uh, short block itself yes that will work Upper lower oil pans are different. Um, the heads actually are completely different. The blocks in some ways are will not work because, um, and I say will not, and I know that sounds like I'm jumping back and forth, but there's a couple of different iterations of the Max 47. So the Max 47 actually used a lot larger um, oil cooler, much larger oil cooler, 
because they didn't use a dual sequential turbocharger. They had some room in the valley and they put and they used that well. It's almost as though the international designed an engine in spite of, uh, well, uh, a little bit uh, of spite towards Ford when they did this. It's almost like they, they knew it. And the reason why is because Ford's engineers got involved uh, with this program instead of international being uh, trusted they were actually getting involved. Now, Ford had at that time, up to that point, had really no place in the diesel market, uh, at least as it's concerning the pickup trucks as we know today. So they built it the way that Ford said to build it. They did not build their engines the way that Ford said to build them, uh, which is interesting because um, while they are very problematic, they are not as problematic as is the 6.4 liter. All right, without further ado, uh, we're going to go ahead and jump into some of the problems. Well, here we have a knucklehead that's sticking his head down the exhaust pipe. We know that's a terrible thing. And you, you know, the black smoke, it's diesel fuel that, uh, it's power that you can see, but you can't use kind of thing. Right? So 20 to one typically is when we start seeing, uh, black soot and stuff coming out of the tailpipe as far as air, air fuel ratio. Um, there's a big issue though with the 6.4 liter because the emission standard, somebody had the brilliant idea. Uh, to be able to meet the emission standards, something was done that had never been done before. What was done had, was this. A diesel particulate filter was installed into the uh, exhaust of the engine. Now, on top of that, there were also not one, but two EGR coolers. This EGR cooler was actually used and uh, it was actually chilled by coolant early on. Um, and that's the reason why the Job 1 trucks, the 2008, you'll see that there's a coolant line that's going from the um, uh, reservoir to um, the EGR valve. And they're trying to cool this valve because they thought, okay, by doing so, maybe we can keep the coking down and different things like that. They actually went the wrong way with it. Um, if you'll note there, it's quite differently uh, placed on the 6.7s. So they put it on the hot side of the charger instead of uh, the cold side of the intake. Um, there were some differences in the way that they mount uh, the EGR valves. So that being said, the the absolute worst thing they could have possibly done to this engine, they did. They, I don't think if there were uh, mistakes that had could could have been made on this engine, uh, if they were you know kind of proverbial like the, the the potholes in the road, I don't think Ford missed one of them. And if they did, they threw it in reverse and they uh, floored it and went back and made sure they hit them again, because this thing is just absolutely riddled with problems. Um, it's not a hard thing to talk about the six four four liter of problems and look for things to talk about. This is probably the engine that has absolutely the most, uh, the, the most content of any engine platform ever. So let's explain to you why it was such a bad idea that the emission system on this truck worked the way that it did. And it has since never been used again. Because the number seven and the number eight cylinders, the ones in the very back, uh, would on the exhaust stroke, have a fuel injector that would inject diesel fuel as the piston is going downward and there is no heat in the cylinder. Um, at, towards bottom dead center, there's an injector that will spray and it will spray fuel into the, uh, into the cylinder. And as the piston comes up, it's gonna push all the fuel out into the exhaust, into the uh, diesel particulate filter uh, where it will ignite because it takes 700 degrees to burn hydrocarbons, where it will ignite and turn that ash into soot. Now there's, uh, or that soot, excuse me, into ash. There's a big problem with that. Anybody that knows anything uh, about engines, period, knows that uh, it is absolutely crucial to have a gasket, which is also known as oil, on the cylinder wall, because that is what provides the ring sealing against the cylinder wall. Now, uh, diesel fuel is great for cleaning. Um, it's fine for lubricating uh, in fuel systems where uh, there is not that much of a, um, uh, the hydrodynamic wedge is uh, not as, it's still critical, but it does not have as much force on the internal components as does an engine. So what happens is, is all this diesel fuel now washes off the cylinder wall. Well, there's a problem. Now you have cleaned the cylinder wall thoroughly so that the ring can do its job of eroding the cylinder wall away and creating tremendous amounts of thrust wear. Absolutely terrible, terrible, terrible idea. I cannot begin to tell you how bad of an idea that is. Then on top of that, all the fuel that goes into the cylinder wall, the cross hatching is going to sneak past 
because of the viscosity of this thing, it is going to actually ease past the rings and into the oil. Well, <laughs> there's another problem. Funny enough, if you look through the maintenance manual of a 6.4 liter engine early on, they said that these were low maintenance engines. Absolutely nothing could be further from the truth. They uh, initially came out and said, you can do 10,000 mile oil changes on this thing. Um, and I wish that I had that I thought about that earlier. I would have uh, actually snapped that out of the uh, snapshot out of the Ford maintenance manual. They quickly uh, pulled that down uh, as they were having failures left and right. I mean, they jumped out of the, the proverbial fire, uh, frying pan into the fire on this engine. They thought the six liter was bad. The six liter wasn't a patch to this thing. So all the fuel gets into the oil. And when it gets into the oil, guess where it goes? Uh, you've guessed it. It goes right into... Uh, now into the bearings uh, that no longer can be supported because the oil does not have the ability to support because the hydrodynamic wedge is breaking down because, like I said, loss of viscosity, the city stoke level drops. It's just, a, it's nasty. It's just a bad, bad idea. So that was the original problem with emission systems and that. Now, uh, I really wish, okay, good. It's a very blurred uh, picture here. Um, and unfortunately, I, I don't know of a way to make that uh, unpixelated, but uh, this is uh, obviously the power stroke and the compression stroke. Thrust wear on an engine occurs when the crankshaft is uh, moving in the direction of rotation, right? As it comes up, keep in mind the crankshaft is turning the same way. Uh, the piston is not lo what I would consider loaded. The 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 uh, not on the um, um, not on the initial stroke. Well, if we take and we uh, pull in the intake, right? For, for our different four different cycles, uh, as the piston's going down, it's not the, the system's not loaded, right? Or the the I'm saying system, but what I mean by that is is the rotational assembly is not loaded. As it goes up under the compression stroke, we absolutely do have uh, some some loading of the uh, components there, and we're putting pressure on it. But peak cylinder pressure obviously occurs under the power stroke. When this firing happens uh, and this thing uh, is being forced down, it pushes the wrist pin or the piston itself rotates about the wrist pin's axis and when it does it digs into the cylinder wall with the rings and once that actually happens it creates uh, tremendous amounts of thrust wear on that cylinder wall um, and that causes the cylinder wall to wear out a much much faster rate okay so we've kind of discussed the emission systems and um, we've discussed basically everything that, that, that happens with that for the 6.4 power stroke uh, issues that we see here um, on this particular standpoint, you can see that it looks like it uh, it really, really got hot. Well, there's problems um, again with that. What they kept was the, 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 the first cousin of the 6.4 was the 6 liter. And they really didn't change much anything. There was a quick changeover and they needed to do it cheap and they needed to do it fast. The reason why you see the difference between the 18 and the 20 millimeter head studs is because and it was coming off the heels of the 6 liter, and then they needed to transfer it over for the 6.4. They were going to try to fix one of the big issues on the 6.4 real quick. And the way that what they were going to do to try to fix that was your head, head gaskets blowing. And they were a notorious failure problem with the 6 liter with the head gaskets blowing. Well, what they did is they increased the stud size of the, uh, or the bolt shaft, the, the diameter of the, the bolt. Um, and they increased the, the diameter of the clamping uh, apparatus or the nut. Um, and for what we're using, not, but uh, for the factory, it would be a bolt because all our engines come with um, head studs um, for the 6.4 liter, except for the Model C. Now, that being said, that larger diameter uh, allows for more clamp force. Uh, it's spread out over the, uh, the face of the, of the head, which gives more clamping load. Now, I say all that to say that the oil cooler design had not uh, actually really changed. Ford still uses the same oil cooler design um, to a certain extent. The oil cooler itself, they've, they've expanded on it, they've made it a little bit larger, but really it's, it is a uh, what I call an encapsulated cooling type system um, where instead of it being submerged in coolant like a Cummins or a Duramax, uh, coolant goes into the oil cooler uh, and it's mixed with oil. Uh, obviously they can't mix together, but they're layered. Um, on these were seven layers of coolant, seven layers of, of oil, and uh, that uh, that um, passages uh, that were sandwiched like that would allow the dissipation to take place between the heat and oil and the absorption 
uh, to go and be dissipated throughout the radiator. But the problem with it is, is that these oil coolers still get stopped up. And when they get stopped up, the oil gets uh, overheated drastically. When that happens, and the reason why they get stopped up, excuse me, is the sediment that's in the block. You know, we talked a little bit about the 6-7 last uh, week and how they changed to a compacted graphite iron block. Uh, the compacted graphite iron block has a different process in which uh, the casting is done, um, but it does not, it's not subjected to the same uh, issues that the, the gray cast iron is with the tremendous amounts of um, silicate and sand that's in the, those castings um, and ultimately winds up stopping up the oil cooler. So this is what you're looking at right now is a standpipe. Now, that standpipe, as it's melted, um, it liquefies the um, uh, resin that, um, that makes up that, step, that standpipe. And that goes somewhere and it gets right past the oil filter because it's on the inside. So it's got a direct shot to the crankshaft. Typically, that's when you start seeing guys wiping out cam, uh, crankshafts because uh, now that, um, that it, it has a straight shot to that, it's going to block the, uh, it's going to actually block the, the passageways. Some other problems that we see from this, and this is not only isolated, the 6.4 liter, the uh, lifter failure is notorious problem um, and they're not as bad as the six liters were and there's reasons for that the reason why the six liter was more problematic was because the six liter uh, being that it was a Huey injection system uh, had combined gas law effect that was happening so the more we compress the oil the more heat that we had to deal with we're not using that and they thought they could get away with it without having those problems still though uh, that oil filter or excuse me that oil cooler design was sorely inferior uh, for its application, especially when you start getting into F450s and 350s and 550 trucks. It just does not have the ability to cool the oil as it should. When this happens, what you see is, is the needle bearings. Uh, you start having fluid film breakdown of the oil. It oxidizes about 235, 240 degrees. As that begins to break down now, uh, we start having failure of the lifter bearings on the lifters. And um, they, because they are, again, that bearing is the fastest moving bearing in the whole engine. Uh, as it's traveling around uh, the axle of the, the lifter. And so that is the only thing here. You can see a failure of that. Once that happens, uh, it takes out the camshaft. And once the camshaft's out, this thing, ha the camshaft actually comes out the rear of the engine. So there's really no good way of doing this except for, I mean, you're in for a whole overhaul at this point. It's not like a 350 Chevrolet where you can snatch lifters out, you know, again, all that metal that still goes in there still needs to be pulled out and done the right way. But I guess it would be a temptation to some folks to pull out the lifters, push in a new camshaft and uh, try to clean it as best they can in the vehicle. But this is not going to work that way because it's in the rear. You can always tell lifter failures pretty quick because they'll leave their tail on the, uh, the gear rotor pump on the 6.4 liter. You can see the indentations uh, right there by the thumb. You can see that that's the needle bearings that pass through. Uh, the the pickup tube. Now that's the only bearing that's small enough that will actually pass through the grid of the pickup tube and that will take out the oil pump as well. So we talked a little bit about fuel dilution based off of the um, uh, emission systems. Now there's a couple of other problems with fuel dilution and we really fi find this and fight this um, with new installs. Uh, a lot of these guys are running aftermarket fuel pumps. Um, there's I won't mention names, but anyway, they're running aftermarket fuel pumps. On the back side, you can't see it on this picture, but on the opposite side, there's a shaft seal. The shaft seal is designed to run into about four pounds positive pressure. The issue is that these guys are running into is, is they're putting aftermarket pumps on these trucks because they're running uh, more pulse width on the injectors so that they have to keep up with more rail pressure. Um, and that pump cannot, the factory pump can't maintain enough fuel pressure to the, the lift pump can't maintain enough fuel, uh, fuel pressure to the high pressure uh, pump that you're seeing here. And so they put these pumps on, but the pumps can run all the way up to 12, 15 pounds of pressure. That's more pressure than what the seal was designed to maintain. And it actually can cause that, that uh, uh, seal on the backside to start to leak. When that takes place, the fuel is going into the crankcase. So now we have just absolutely all kinds of issues. You're talking about main uh, main bearing failures left and right on these things because fuel is not uh, a supplement for oil. It will not uh, provide the necessary 
uh, wedge that is needed for the crankshaft and the bearing. If they come in contact at any time, uh, then it's going to be metal to metal. All it takes for aluminum, because generally you have copper, tin, and lead, uh, and I say aluminum, but copper, tin, and lead on a bearing. Um, the melting point of that bearing uh, is approached very, very rapidly if there is no uh, oil to uh, to maintain that that separation between the two, and it happens. I mean, within uh, within seconds, and then once that takes place, the bearings are spun, and, and it's a bad day for everybody. One of the things, though, also uh, in this picture is an injector line between the injector and the pump. This is a this is a, a fuel line that must be replaced anytime the engine is installed. It has a uh, compression fitting that mates to the injector on one side and on the other side the high pressure common rail. Um, so the rail and the injector have a line that is a throwaway line. It's disposable. You're not to reuse this. Anytime you open that line uh, and you remove the line, um, it's almost like fingerprints. They have to go back exactly the same way that they are uh, designed uh, to, um, uh, to mate together. And you can't really and truly duplicate that exactly um, every time. So if for any reason that line has to be taken loose, it has to be replaced. It is expensive. Those lines are typically around $30 from Ford. Uh, and a lot of guys don't want to do that. So instead of doing that, what they tend to do is, is reuse them, clean them up and say, well, it was only on for you know 20 minutes or whatever. It doesn't really matter what the length of time um, that the line was on. That has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with it uh, concerning the crimping that takes place and the uh, basically the the, uh, the uh, impression that's left on the line uh, from the mating surfaces. So that can create fuel leaks. They go again. These are all big, big issues. Now we knew about six, seven last week. We talked about it. One thing that Ford did was in their 6.7 liter, they were quick to change that fuel line and move it to the outside of the, uh, of the engine so that if it did develop a leak, that it would be external and it's a whole lot easier to fix an external leak if one you can see it two it doesn't do damage to the engine so it's far more uh profitable to have that thing on the outside of the engine now lly and lb7 the, the, the injector issue on the duramaxes they quickly remedied the problem they were having obviously they were having injector failures and they needed it to be more serviceable but with that they also moved those injector lines outside on top of that there's a white o-ring right uh let's see right here on the injector i don't know um well, actually i don't need control you can see it now that injector if that injector o-ring leaks now there's a little difference between the injector and on the 6.4 and the 6.0 well there's a lot of difference one is is the uh the little line that you see uh the injector o-ring that you see that uh with the cursor on it below um is actually uh, a weak hole for the return line so in the cylinder head, uh, it's different than a 6.4. The 6.4 would supply the fuel into the, through the cylinder head, so you have 55, 60 pounds of pressure going through. That's not the case on the 6.4 liter. The 6.4 liter has nothing but the return fuel side coming out of the cylinder head. All the rail pressure, all the fuel pressure going to the injector is supplied through the fitting that you see that the injector line would uh, screw onto. So if that, though, if that injector O-ring gets cut for whatever reason, uh, or it leaks, again, we can expect fuel to be into uh, the crankcase and cause its damage there. That is one reason why we are very, um, we are uh, very um, um, pro uh, a certain procedure of installation. And that procedure would actually uh, include Turning the high pressure, or excuse me, turning the low pressure fuel pump on with the oil pan bolt uh, removed. And when we do this, we always tell people, please take the uh, dipstick and put it on top of the, the steering somewhere, just so that you'll know this engine does not have oil in it. Don't try to start it up that way. Uh, but if you'll turn the the, the lift pump on uh, with the um, nut, or the excuse me, with the uh, drain pan bolt out, and leave it running for 30 minutes, if there is any leaks. That develop um, on the low pressure side that will allow us to see and on the return side that will allow us to see that that's happening and it's draining outside of the uh, lower oil pan and we can catch it before any damage occurs so it's very critical to install these the right way 
Now we talked about spun main bearings. Main bearings are definitely a problem on these things. Uh, you can see here where uh, this thing was, uh, it, it got, it was spun really, really bad. You can actually see the shading on all the way around. There's a lot of reasons for spinning main bearings, but primarily uh, the biggest portion of spinning main bearings is because of fuel evolution. Nine times out of 10, uh, fuel evolution is the biggest problem there. And so uh, if you can combat this by uh, proper installation techniques and also by monitoring, you know, the problem with a 6.4 liter engine is they make tons and tons of power. With the tons and tons of power that they do make, uh, there is the temptation to tune these things beyond the capability of the internal components. Now, that being said, um, what what we'll get into that, we'll show some of the damages that take place. But the 6.4 liter really could be a fantastic engine. It really just needs to be owned by two people. One's an old man, the other's a mechanic. But other than that, um, here are some of the performance mods that we do for the... Um, for those engines. Now, if you look in the top left corner, you can see the factory dowel. Now, here's what happens uh, at the top left corner there and the bottom corner, uh, there, that is the dowel pin that actually locates that bed plate. Now, there's a lot of guys out there would tell you bed plate's the best thing in the world. It's, I mean, that, that thing's, you know, you don't need anything else. That bed plate is far superior than main caps. And I would be, uh, I certainly agree with you. I can't argue the point there. That, but the problem with it is, is that a lot of people do not realize that the bed plate is only as good as its ability to be indicated uh, or its repeatability in the installation process. And also, um, the fact is, is that if the surface finish is not um, uh, correct when this thing was mated together, it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference whether you've got a bed plate there or not, because the bed plate will actually move a little bit. And on this particular application, you can see that uh, these dowel pins that were locating uh, the bed plate. Now we've got 10 of them. So you see the four main cap bolts, but there's two on either side. So this thing is very, very rigid. Once it's pushed back onto the block and it's bolted down, it can be repeatable and go right back to the same place. What happens is those pins on the top left and the bottom left corner, they tend to wear in their bore. So because there's so much fretting that takes place. There's a tremendous amount of movement in the bed plate when this thing is actually going down the road, especially if guys are putting more uh, uh, power to the truck, larger tires, that that bed plate wants to skid. And as it does, and it wears the, the, uh, the bores out in those pins, um, what you'll typically see is a misalignment of the bed plate to the block. And the only way really and truly to correct that the right way is to repin it and uh, find that location of center and make sure that it stays that way. Um, we on the performance side of things uh, will uh, install these pins and we don't have any issue with them going anywhere. So, but again, the surface finish of that block was uh, far um, inferior um, and there, it doesn't really matter how tight you torque something. If you don't have two flat surfaces, just like a head gasket, if you don't have two flat surfaces and you go to torque it, then typically what's going to happen is you're going to blow a head gasket. Now, uh, we talked about spun mains. Now, here's another uh, here's another reason for spun mains. You're going to get this a lot, especially the sales team and the guys out there. You're going to have guys, and you need to ask them this question, okay, because people don't know anything, and they're calling you because they need your help, and they expect for you to know this stuff, so it's extremely important. Uh, even though you're not mechanicing on it, maybe, maybe you are, but to know these simple questions. They're going to call you up and they're going to say, hey, um, sometimes it's a, a, an issue with them calling you and telling you that the engine's got a vibration to it after you've installed it. Now, our engines are balanced. All the daily driver, the workhorse, the cask watch, all that stuff's balanced. It comes with a whole balance sheet and all the stuff that goes with it. So these engines should be so, so balanced um, that that typically we, the phone calls that we get back are from customers um, all, when they we call to comment on just how smooth that engine operates. If it's not operating as smoothly as, as that, so that it's noticeably different and there isn't a, there's some sort of vibration in this engine, there's something else going on with it. Um, and typically it can be one of two things. One is it's an aftermarket converter or it's a converter that's out of balance. If that's the case, that's not going to ever get better. It needs to be addressed. 
And there are companies out there that I will not mention, but they have large triple discs and well, quadruple disc converters and five disc converters. Uh, and those converters will actually, they don't do a very good job at balancing. Um, and because of that, uh, that will cause a shimmy and a shake in the back end of this thing. Now, that being said, the thing that you do need to know about is that the 6.4 liter and the 6.0 liter both use a 5R110W transmission. That is the same transmission. It is, uh, there's a later uh, version of it and it starts with a 7 or an 8. All the uh, 6.4 liter power stroke um, part numbers would typically start with a 7 or an 8, whereas the 6 liters would start with you know, 3, uh, 4, 5. Uh, is typically what you know what you'll see because of the, the year model. Now the difference is is that you'll see here there are two weights uh, that we see on that flywheel. Now there's also eight bolts on the flex plate. What guys will do is they'll go to the junkyard and they'll buy a 5R110 transmission. And they will bolt that thing up out of a six liter and they will stick it right up there and they go, yep. Well, I got a problem. I uh, I bought this transmission and it came with a good converter because I know my converter shot. So the problem with it is it won't bolt up because this is an eight bolt and theirs is a six bolt because they pulled it out of a 2005 or six, whatever. And so the first thing they do is they grab their impact and then they yank off all the bolts and they're going to slap another flex plate on and they're going to bolt that dude up and send it down the road and think that was good enough. Well, there's a big problem. There is 220 grams difference between the weight of a 6.4 liter flex plate and a weight of a 6.0, the weights on the flywheel. Now, why would there be that much? Well, I can tell you. Rotational assembly, there's about, uh, well, the factory is a 3 inch 740 thousandths on a 6 liter and 3 inch 870 thousandths on a 6.4 liter. So you can do the math on that real quick and find out that the bore diameter uh, between 640 and 870, um, you know, you're looking almost a quarter of an inch larger bore. Well, generally things with larger mass have larger amounts of weight. Well, this is no different if they're all given the same uh, material. And that that's exactly what happened here. So we have a lot larger uh, rotational assembly and the mass that goes with it. So they had to counteract that with a larger weight on the back of the flywheel. When you do that, then now you have thrown this engine into absolute imbalance and the crankshaft into orbit. And that will cause premature bearing failure. And we see it. We see it happen quite often with people. You cannot do that. Now, this is a six liter. This has got one, uh, uh, one smaller weight. And actually, in this picture, for whatever reason, it looks bigger than what it is, but it's actually a smaller weight than the 6.4. The 6.4 has got two large. Uh, it would be about like this same weight, except there's two of them on it. You can see the balancing holes uh, on the left-hand side. You also see that this is a six-bolt flex plate. Uh, so that's how you'll know the difference between the two. I can give you horror stories after that. When uh, you know, I've, I've I've seen that happen way too many times. It's just not good. 6.4 liter power stroke makes it a lot of power on the bottom end. The turbocharger, because we said it was a dual sequential turbocharger, uh, they build boost way down low. Now, that means at 1400 RPMs, this thing can achieve 25 pounds of boost. I use this illustration quite often, and I think I used it the other day in the 6.7, uh, but I said, you know, is a glass of water very heavy? And people would say, no, it's, it's not. Well, then if you hold it out sh straight for all day, then I can promise you it will be heavy when I get back. So the same thing goes with the uh, the amount of force that's being applied to the, the connecting rod. Um, boost pressure. People will say, well, 25 pounds of boost is not much pressure. Well, that's true and that's false. It all depends on how long you have to maintain it. So these things can actually hit 40 pounds of boost at about 16, maybe 1600 RPMs, not even that much. But problem with it is, is now they have to carry that pressure, uh, that cylinder pressure, it goes up exponentially uh, because we have a dual sequential turbocharger that's already making boost way down low. So we are loading the mess out of the bottom end of that engine. Now, they go, some folks go, well, wait a minute, that's only because you're running a tuner. Well, that's actually not true. Your exhaust back pressure sensor is where your ECM looks to find out how much boost pressure this truck's actually making. It's a terrible idea. 
uh, it's absolutely a terrible idea. Um, the reason why is there's this little thing called soot. Soot gets in the sensor. And once soot gets in the sensor, then the sensor is reading erroneously the uh, amount of boost pressure, or in this case, uh, the adiabatic efficiency of the uh, uh, the engine and the, uh, the efficiency there it's looking at the exhaust back pressure so it can figure that if the exhaust back pressure is x then the boost pressure will be y and so that it bases its its uh, strategy for the actuator off of uh, what we're seeing on the uh, uh, on the boost pressure side in later years they will change this to the manifold absolute pressure sensor which makes way more sense because you don't have the same amount of soot but yet there is quite a bit there to, still too um, if that sensor is plugged and you install this thing on uh, a, a new engine or an existing engine, doesn't really matter, uh, you're typically going to wind up uh, running into issues of bent connecting rods and it also tweaks the crankshaft. Now, here's a video um, that may be kind of a, a little bit splotchy, but if you'll watch the needle, um, even though this video is, uh, is kind of interrupted, you can actually see the amount of um, swing there is on the Arnold gauge. The Arnold gauge is that dirty little yellow gauge sitting up there at the top. So this is showing in about three, three and a half thousand run out. So what run out is, is, um, well, when I was a kid growing up, we had a three wheeler that a uh, little 110 Honda. We went to unload it one day and accidentally dropped it out of the back of the truck and it hit on one side of the tire. From there on out, when you go down the road, it would hop with you going down the road because the shaft was bent. That's called run out. So uh, your crankshaft is kind of hopping as well. And so that actually wears the bearings inconsistently. So a couple of things. That crankshaft, you'll always see it on the number two and the number four journal. The reason for the number two and the number four journals, that's where the counterweights are also located on that crankshaft. So I actually have that, that really uh, there is more stress in that area because of the counterweights that are acting. You start to have a, a little bit of a... Um, well, uh, you still tend to have more load on the number two and number four, but it will always equate to run out on those two journals. Now, there's things that can be done. Um, there are companies and there are people out there that will actually try to bend this crankshaft. That's kind of common practice. The problem with it is, is uh, metal has memory. We say that often. Um, if you bend metal, it will stay that way until it doesn't stay that way. Um, there, it's not going to straighten itself out it's going to remain bent. So the issue is, is if you straighten the thing out and it's already been uh, tweaked. I don't know if you've ever had a gate. I grew up on a farm and, uh, you know, you would uh, go to close the cattle gate and the cattle gate's just been hanging on these hinges for so many years that it was twisted. And you could take it and you could twist it one way and it would sit that way pretty well until somebody came along, smacked it, and then all of a sudden it would pop back the other way that it always had been. The crankshaft's the same way. And so if you just bend this crankshaft, all you're doing is uh, trying to put it back uh, to a straight uh, state in equilibrium. But as soon as the, piston, the, the first cylinder fires up, it's going to retract back to its position. Uh, for that reason, we are a pro for crank grounding, the, uh, for grinding the crankshafts uh, into uh, to a straight position. Now, we said about bent connecting rods, um, you know, just because you're, I saw a meme like that, and I think they may have used this picture, but just because you're, you're different doesn't mean that you're special or uh, you're useful. I think that's, that's what the <laughs> meme said. But in this picture, uh, we definitely have a special connecting rod. It's not very useful, but it is special nonetheless. So it's bent, as you can see. And uh, the reason why it's bent is not from hydrolock. Um, it's typically bent like that. And what people don't realize, a couple things about powdered metal rods. Powdered metal rod is not the same as what it was in the days of the 7.3 liter when they first came out. Uh, they were a lot less tough and a lot more hard, so they would fracture. So typically on a 7.3, uh, when you have toughness, then you have a little bit of malleability. When you have hardness, you shatter like carbide. Um, when you started putting a lot of stress on a powder metal rod, um, then they will just, they'll implode. The, the, the rod's coming apart on a 7.3 and now it becomes a buzzsaw. Not so with a 6.4 liter. 6.4 will actually, look how much twist there is on that rod. I mean, that's that's pretty remarkable. That thing's like a rubber band. You know, if you tried to do that with, like I say, a 7.3 liter, it never would do that. That powder metal rod would just snap in half. 
Um, but that's not the case with the, the new rods that they have with the way that powder metal is designed nowadays. So, I mean, you can look and you can see, just look at the edge uh, where the wrist pin would go. And you can actually look at that and tell there's probably a, man, it's almost, uh, I'd say a hundred thousandths lower than the rest of the rods. So you have guys all the time that say, hey, how, you know, I can make 800 horsepower on my factory rods. And what they don't realize is, is that you can make it true enough and you keep it. That's the problem. Uh, what happens is, is that they bend. Well, the standard of excellence is not, can you make it? It is, is it, will it last? Is there any uh, damage? Is there anything else going on with it while that's happening? So just because you don't see a rod hanging outside of the block, that is not the true indicator that you've been a connecting rod. The indicator that you've been a connecting rod will be seen, sure enough, uh, shortly. So here's what we see. Typically what will happen. There's two different types of bend on a, on, on a connecting rod. You can either bend a rod or you can twist a rod. Um, you know, and that typically, um, that's just in what axis of, that it's, it's, it's actually been at. This thing was bent so bad, though, that the wrist pin, as it would come down, um, would actually come in contact uh, with the crankshaft, and it just busted off the 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 skirt, excuse me, of the uh, of the piston. So that's one thing, and typically, you know, that's when the guy goes, "I have this light." Let me back up just a second. I have this light. Oh wait a minute. Oh, it's one I want to see. Sorry. I have this light tapping noise. I just don't know where it's coming from, and I don't know whatever that SNL skit or whatever I forgot where I saw it from. And it's this guy, you know, he's saying he's got a terrible headache. And there's this big red mark, you know, I don't know if it's Tommy War or whatever, but that's kind of the way I feel like when people are going, you know, I just got this slight tapping noise. I just see this huge red mark on the side of the guy's head. The reason for that is, is because the connecting rod is actually uh, uh, bent in a lot of times, and it's actually uh, tapping on the counterweight of the crankshaft. Now, here we see two very identifiable marks on the side of the cylinder wall. Now, there's a reason why there's two marks on the side of the cylinder wall. The reason why is because a wrist pin clip on this thing is absolutely just a clip. And it's not a, doesn't have any eyelets or anything like that. It's just like a piece of wire that's just, you know, cut on one end. It's like a C. Well, those two grooves that you see, that's the ends of the C. That's the ends of the wrist clip. What are the, uh, the wrist pin clip? So what happens is, is as you tweak the rod to one angle, it, blo it side loads the, the piston and it blows the end of the wrist pin out uh, where the boss is on, on the piston itself and the clip goes and comes out. And so uh, then now the wrist pin is coming in contact uh, up and down the cylinder wall, right? So, um, you know, it's funny because in aircraft engines, they actually use buttons for this. And uh, <laughs> I guess you might be better off using a button than you would a clip, but either way, right, if you've been through a ride, you're going you're gonna to wind up blowing it up anyhow. But um, anyways, this, this wrist pin going up and down is what causes these grooves to uh, just absolutely destroy the cylinder. Anytime we see this, we immediately know what's going on with it. Now, here's what happens. The warranty claims are typically going to end up like this. Uh, I got 50,000 miles or 40,000 miles on my engine. And what happens is, is the customer goes, you know, the rod failed, the rod failed, the rod failed. Well, the rod typically does not fail. We saw how much twisting could actually take place of a powdered metal rod for it to fail and it didn't fail i mean this thing was bent like a pretzel and it still didn't fail there's one thing that will make a rod fail and that is when the rod is completely uh broken away from the rift the uh the piston itself and it becomes a buzz saw that buzz saw will hit the side of the block and do all kind of damage uh and when that takes place yeah the next thing you're going to see is a rod in the pan that's cut in half but that's what you're doing you're sawing it in half it doesn't fail and bend like a typical rod. So if we go back through and we look here, you can see the bottom pin, part of that wrist pin, or excuse me, uh, part of that pin boss area of the, the pad on the piston. Now, what would cause this crazy uh, wear at the bottom of the piston? Well, it would be the uh, counterweight of the crankshaft because every time that piston comes downward because of the rod being bent now, the piston's coming down like this, it's smacking the side of the counterweight on the uh, on the crankshaft and that counterweight eventually will saw that dude in half and when it does the wrist pin is going to get pulled out from the piston and when that takes place now all we have is a piston that has departed the chat and it's still maybe up in the bore whatever 
uh, and maybe hanging in in there, maybe not, maybe fall, maybe it falls down. But the other end of that connecting rod has nothing to guide it. Now the piston's not guiding it up and down the bore. So what's it do? Well, it's going to wind up just sawing this whole engine in half. And that's exactly what happens. And that's the reason why people don't understand. And it all started from a bent connecting rod that you didn't know was bent. So that's a big, big problem there. So you can see this one, if it hadn't been stopped, it was just moments from uh, catastrophic failure. Other issues are nothing that's isolated to the 6.4 liter, but it's typically, you know, it's something that we all in the diesel world are very familiar with. And that is, is the injectors that are hanging open and melting the pistons. This one actually melted it all the way down to the salt ring that you can see where the oil galley would be for the piston cooling jet. That's the reason why it's uh, kind of got that uh, round ring up there at the top. It went down to past the intermediate. It looks like it stopped just at the oil ring. Anyway, there's nothing you can do about that so much as you know people say well replace your injectors and well, that's great and all but you know that can be just water and the fuel the next fuel stop that you take so i mean it's really important to know uh that you're getting fuel quality source you're draining your fuel filters uh and you're doing proper maintenance um other failures of the wrist pins or excuse me other failures of the uh the the, pin, the pistons of the engines are cracked uh, piston, which is pretty common on a 6.4 liter, probably more so common uh, on a 6.4 liter than it is on any other engine. The LML on the Duramax is definitely notorious for more uh, failed pistons. Uh, the 6.7 power stroke, or excuse me, 6.7 Cummins is more problematic with that. You know, we've gone into a deep dive on to what causes a failure. I can tell you this right now, wherever that crack starts and it looks like it's on the right hand side, I can't tell what bank it is because it's going to be underneath the exhaust valve uh, every single time. Um, every single time it's going to be underneath the exhaust valve. And the reason why is because of heat. Uh, typically, people would initially say that this engine had a design failure um, on the wrist pin or excuse me, I don't know why I keep saying that, on the piston itself. Uh, that would cause the failure was a casting issue or whatever. Uh, none of that's really true. The fact is, is the reason why these things failed was because heat. Heat is the enemy to all things mechanical. And so uh, what happens is, is that because the combustion bowl, and we'll go ahead and click forward, uh, because the combustion bowl is a reentrant design. Now, I wish I had uh, capability to show you with this with a cursor, but Adam, if you're still there, you can take a look at the uh, the top of that, um, the top of the uh, uh, combustion chamber where the lip is, and that lip is actually where the reverse flow takes place for the cylinder head. So we're trying to force the oxygen in the cylinder and the fuel in the cylinder into the hottest areas for most complete amount of combustion. So that lip redirects that back towards the center. Problem with it is, is that because of that lip having a re-entrant style um, uh, uh, lip, there is a dwell that takes place um, on the piston and it develops a hot spot. So where the circle is, um, let's see if I can try this. Yeah. Okay. I just got a delayed reaction. Okay, great. So where the circle is here, you can actually see, maybe I can zoom in. I don't know if you're going to see this or not. I'll try to do it. Okay, there's a cutting torch where the little hand is. It looks like somebody took a cutting torch and just cut that thing in half. Um, the reason for that is because obviously heat is, is what is causing the erosion of that metal, of that material, the aluminum. And uh, so that's where it actually starts. The crack starts to develop there. Um, and it's actually a pinhole. It's a pitting that takes place of the piston. Once that pitting takes place, everything else is kind of a, uh, a segue to the uh, inevitable. So um, there's really nothing. It'll start burning the oil actually from underneath the opposite side. See that the holes underneath it here are where your piston cooling jet is spraying oil, and uh, it's just basically uh, it sprays into the bottom and it can circulate to try to draw the heat out of that. But that's what causes a failure. Uh, extreme heat, and obviously we know heat and pressure are synonymous at some point in time. You can start seeing the erosion take place and how it's fragmenting some of the material. That's just, like I said, that's that cutting torch effect that takes place. Now, the things that we do to combat this is that we change the pistons. Uh, we use a different design piston, and we machine the pistons so that they don't have the failures that the uh, other ones did. Now, it's not that the piston was necessarily bad. 
the problem with it was is that uh, a lot of these guys were tuning these trucks and that's where they're seeing these failures and some of them aren't some of them are factory but even if they are factory then uh, keep in mind they have diesel particulate filters on these things and uh, that's what's causing the engine to uh, achieve higher tempers temperatures because it has nowhere to go this is a hundred thousand mile a serviceable item that should be taken and cleaned off um, every hundred thousand miles but I mean who really does that typically you don't do it till you have a problem um, so that backs all that heat back up into the um, into the uh, the engine and the piston takes the brunt of it. Here's some six seven power stroke pistons, but they have a polyfin coating. Um, I can't really show you the combustion chamber on our pistons because I don't have a picture of that. You can tell on the later versions of the 6.7 liter, they actually did uh, a different combustion bowl design change altogether. They the reentrant portion of the uh, excuse me the reentry portion portion of the piston is actually moved down in the chamber it's not up as high and uh, because of that it's moving it away from um, uh, some of the highest amounts of pressure it puts a little bit more mass uh, with that lip down lower than actually extending it out uh, if it raised up so that's the reason why they moved um, that reentry lip down and uh, they basically chamfered the the top portion of that piston. So it's quite a bit of difference in the combustion. Um, another thing that we do not do here is spray well technology. This is what Ford Motor Company and their infinite wisdom did for the remanufacturing processes when they partnered with Caterpillar, and it was an absolute nightmare. So spray welding is, is pretty common practice in the larger engine applications, 3,500, 3,600 walk shells, different things like that, the larger industrial engines. The, but they typically do a static surface like a uh, main cap uh, where the um, saddle is they'll spray well that sometimes the deck portion depending on how many times that engine's been serviced i mean those engines in the cores are hundred thousand dollars so they do whatever they can to, to salvage that here's the problem with spray welding um, with a dynamic surface like you're using in the cylinder wall preparation is everything um, if you don't have the 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 right preparation for this uh, application you're going to have the elimination and it was such a disaster that they just they absolutely abandoned that whole process altogether. But there's still a lot of engines out there with that uh, that type of application that are done. They're ticking time bombs. Uh, so that's the reason why we don't uh, recommend a Ford Reman product. Now keep in mind, the remanufacturers, again, uh, not to beat up on anybody, but they're looking for the cheapest. <clears throat> they're looking for somebody with a budget, right? Uh, Ford's trying to make their margins on that engine. And so they cut corners in certain ways, honestly, than... Uh, I mean, it just is what it is. It's a dirty little secret of, of remanufacturing. You can start seeing here some of that uh, taking place as well on one of these blocks. Um, you can uh, see it here as well. Uh, you start seeing a, a glazing. almost looks like somebody left coolant in the cylinder, uh, but that's actually not the case here. This is uh, uh, actually from that starting to delaminate now what we use <clears throat> these pictures are a little bit out of order this is a flange sleeve this is actually uh the flange sleeve is quite a bit different than a straight wall sleeve um, i'm going to come back to that picture this picture is near and dear to my heart because this is this, the picture that actually put me in uh in the machining business if you look on that other pitch that piston over there to the left it looks like it's brand new that's because it had 15 seconds of run time the reason why this thing grenaded I don't know if you can see my arrow right there or not, but you can see that's a straight wall sleeve. And the machine shop that we used years ago when I was a technician uh, installed eight of these straight wall sleeves because they had uh, the spray weld done to them. And I told them I did not want him to, uh, to use this block um, with that spray weld on it because I already knew what it would do. So let's go ahead and sleeve it and fix it right for the customer. Well, there's a big problem. He machined this thing and he didn't machine it correctly because he machined the step off the bottom of the block where the sleeve would sit. And what happened is as the piston came up, the ring jumped up over that lip. And now because the piston ring was up over the lip, it used that ring to pull that sleeve into the block. And when it did, it absolutely grenaded this engine. So for that reason, uh, I have never installed ever on any of our engines ever installed anything but a flange sleeve. A flange sleeve has a counterbore. You cannot, now it sits between the block on this side and the head on that side, like a big truck. It can't go anywhere. Um, it just remedies a lot of problems. I've had other manufacturers have a lot of issues 
uh, it's more expense to put a flange sleeve on, but it is truly the best repair for that. Um, so that's the way that we actually on this picture too, you can see, see the difference in the piston. That's a max four seven style piston, which is what we use for all our updated 6.4 liters. So we fixed that problem as well. With the flange sleeve on the higher applications, you start seeing on the higher horsepower applications, you start seeing some of the cracking into the water uh, jacket areas and things like that. By us flange, uh, using the flange sleeves, that remedies those problems as well. So we have, there's a method to the madness. There's reasons for this. We use different castings um, uh, for the most part on these things. This is actually an integrated seat. It's a parent metal seat. So the seat is actually part of the casting on the head. So when they manufacture this thing, all they're doing is basically manufacturing, casting the head, cutting the seats. And then they come back and they induction harden the seats. So uh, if a crack develops, then it will continue to spread. You can see that this has been magnetically particle, uh, magnetic particle inspection here, and they uh, you see where the cracks are. They've highlighted it with a white paint pen. It's very problematic. You start seeing it. You know, it develops the seat and then goes all the way to the glow plug, or it goes all the way to the injector, and that's more problem. Uh, the things that we do to combat that are uh, we use a install pressed seat so that the, you know heat dissipation from the valve actually occurs. About 80% of it goes through. Uh, from the face of the valve uh, goes into the seat. So that's where your heat dissipation actually uh, occurs. And that from there, obviously, it goes into the coolant system. Uh, so it's important to have a much more durable material uh, there, not just for the wear of the, the seat itself, but also for the crack. That's, again, another way that we remedy the problems that we have. Blown head gaskets aren't really uh, a big issue on the 6.4 liter for the reason of, like we said before, um, because of the uh, diameter of the, the bolt. But we also do offer that in the workhorse application with the O-ring cylinder heads and thermal coated combustion chambers as well uh, for heat absorption in those areas. One of the other issues that we'll mention while we're in here is the 6.4 liter engine was, again, it was coming off the heels of the six liter. Uh, the predecessor, when it would fire an injector, it would actually spray oil out of the injector and an emit an oil uh, onto the rocker tip. Problem with it is, is that in their haste, uh, all they did was removed uh, one system and installed another system, but never really gave account of the repercussions that might take place by any alterations that they had done. So uh, what happens is, is now we have a rocker arm that when you fire the truck up for, for the first four to five minutes, you absolutely have no oil on top of the rockers. And so here's the problem. When the rocker, as you can see, the anvil in the bottom of the, uh, the that's fallen out, it's because it's worn completely down past the keeper, and then it gets into the rocker. And then what happens is, is now we have tremendous amounts of, because on the preload, it's about 108,000 preload on the uh, on a factory lifter. Problem is, is that uh, once you go past that point, um, then uh, now it becomes, uh, there's, that lifter has a tremendous amount of lash to absorb a tremendous amount of impact. So it becomes just a spring now that's bouncing hydraulically because there should not be that much motion um, because there should not be that much wear. It's not designed to operate that way. So once this takes place, it destroys not only the rocker, you run it long enough, it'll destroy the lifter too because it sends a harmonic basically um, down through the, um, down into the, 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 the lifter from the push rod in the rocker arm. And that is, is, is detrimental to the longevity of the lifter. And again, once the lifter goes, then it takes everything with it. So it might seem like a small thing. And, and all our engines come with new rocker assemblies. We don't reuse any rocker assemblies because that's a wear item, especially on this engine. Now on a 6.0 liter or a 6.7 or a 7.3, not it's not a problem. You could reuse and qualify the part, but you can't do that on a 6.4 because they're all worn. Now, that being said, that's a big problem. It, though it might look like a small problem, it's a very large problem because that in and of itself, by not having the oil up there, can cause engine failure. And so for that reason, we uh, came out and designed the 6.4 oiling valve cover. You can see the fitting up here at the top. Uh, we've changed. It's a, that's an old design that we have, but anyway, still works the same way. And so uh, that valve cover actually sprays oil onto the rocker arms, uh, and you can see that here. So this uh, this whole 
this uh, these jets spray and actually changes by 10 decibels uh, the noise of the engine. So it quietens it, muffles it down quite a bit. Also takes away, you know, some of the heat of the, the, the valve springs. It's not that big of a problem with those engines. But nonetheless, we also see temperatures of about five degrees or more on the oil temperature drop as well because of the heat dissipation properties of the aluminum and the oil that's going through there, it passes the heat into the valve cover and the valve cover has a fan blown over it. So uh, it works out really, really well that way. So those are some of the things um, that the 6.4 liter engine has wrong with it. Uh, I guess uh, that's uh, pretty much it. Um, we could spend even more time if we wanted to and get a little deeper in it. But I think that pretty much, uh, for the most part, and for today's purposes, should equip you with what you need to know when you're talking to a customer about that engine. All right, about this time, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Adam. Thanks, guys. Let's see if I can. I'm going to share my screen here real quick. Um, uh only thing i had i did want to show that video because i don't know what happened on your screen there i apologize um but you can really see the run out pretty easily on that video um so with that being said um thanks everyone for hopping on the call um we'll have another one of these uh next week as we will every monday for a good long while here we're gonna hit the engines first and then um, go from there on other individual parts. And was so there so. anything uh, that we needed to notify them uh, along the lines of uh, website or anything there? There were any changes that were made? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, I will show you that as well. So we've got, for the dealers out there, we have our new dealer portal that is up. Um, you can't just go to the site and find this. We do have to send you a link. Um, but, uh, you know, A or Adam B at chokeperformance.com. Send me an email. I'll get you that. Bug your salespeople. We can get you, uh, you know, links to this. Um, but it'll have, at the moment, it does not have the pricing. We are still working on cleaning up that price sheet. Um, but you can get dealer information or catalog. We've got one sheets on engines, on heads. Uh, pretty much all the collateral you would need is downloads are on here. As we come out with new ones, we will add them there as well. Excuse me. Um, but it's also got all of our warranty information, core information, uh, all the contacts you would need um, for us here. Um, plus all these training videos. This is the first one we did. This is last week's. Uh, very shortly after we get done with this call, the next one will get loaded up there as well. Um, within the next month, we'll probably have at least 20 different videos. Uh, we're working on individual videos for all of our engines, describing what each one has. Um, a lot of it's going to be what we talk about in these um, <clears throat> webinars, excuse me, um, just a little more, uh, more broken down, a little bit quicker watches, stuff you can share with your customers um, or your sales guys. But um, yeah, that's what we got. So um, reach out, we'll uh, we'll send you a link to this and you can, you can check out the dealer portal. Um, any questions on the video, put them in the comments. We are gonna load this to YouTube. So if anyone has any questions, please put that in the comments. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe if you wanna see more of this content in the future. And uh, thanks, everyone. See you next week. Thanks, guys.